Hi Moss here and today I have iFi's Pro IDSD. This is currently their flagship DAC and amp and it packs a really large number of features. Not only is it a DAC and a headphone amp as well as a preamp, but it has options for use in studios, it has network digital inputs, it has optional tube modes like the Pro iCam we looked at before. So I'm going to take you through all of these features and this particular model has just has been updated with the MQA supporting firmware which is currently in beta and with that I'm going to go through all the different features it has then what I'm going to do is tell you about my experience using it and how I think it sounds. So with that let's get started and look at all the different features. So starting with the inputs and outputs on the back the Pro IDSD has, well, it has some conventional inputs and some unusual inputs. So the, of the conventional inputs, you have your uh, USB, which is interestingly USB 3. And the reason for this is that you can use better shielded and better quality USB 3 cables to connect from your computer. That's a useful feature that the iFi products have. Now, the USB uh, has, as they, according to them, all the uh, clever tricks they use for their uh, kind of USB isolators and the noise reducers built in, so you don't need to use any special USB uh, you know, uh, noise reducers or anything else with that they reckon. And they also have a standard SPDIF and uh, AES, which is AES EBU is the pro version of SPDIF available. Now of the unusual inputs you have a network input, both wired and wireless. Now you can't switch between which one you use, you could only do that if you, uh, you know, select them separately. Um, you have the aerial which you can screw on here for the wireless and a standard RJ45 socket for the wired which you set up via the Muso app. Now of, also for the unconventional you have these word clock inputs and word clock uh, pass through and that's used for mainly for pro audio. So in pro audio world if you're hooking up a bunch of comp digital components you, uh, for you know, uh, recording or mastering you need, you need them all to be in sync otherwise your audio can may get out of sync which could be a bit of a disaster. Now in terms of high end audio some people use the word clock separately. Now a digital signal which you know it's usually combined in things like AES and SPDIF, SPDIF and uh, USB of course but the actual digital signal inside a DAC is separated out into the data and then the clock signal which indicates to the DAC what kind of a, what data rate is being processed because if you didn't have a clocked data rate you wouldn't know if it was you know 40 uh, 44.1 48 or uh, or you know 96 or what have you and that would actually be a big problem so but while it's normally combined with the SPDIF you can actually use a separate word clock input and that can be, you know, if you have a high quality clock, and some people have uh, tried this with a high quality clock, it may improve the quality of the digital signal uh, and thus maybe the, in the sound quality output as well. Now, you also have another input which is a USB input, which you can say plug in a thumb drive full of uh, uh, files, you know, music files, and using the Muso app you can play them back. Now, there's also a micro SD card slot, but you can just see I have a card in there, and you also play back files that are on that via the Muso app. Uh, the, of the outputs, you have the standard uh, RCA single-ended and you also have a uh, balanced outputs. Now, you can switch these via this little switch here using a screwdriver and this allows them to be switched between uh, fixed output and variable output. Now, fixed output, of course, if you just want to use it as a DAC to say an amp which has a uh, volume control and variable output if you want to use the volume control built into this, say to active speakers or a, a power amp. Now, you also have the ability to uh, turn that to pro mode, and pro mode puts out a much higher voltage than used in standard serial components, and that's used for you know pro audio systems which need a higher voltage for maybe, I guess, longer cable runs. I'm not a pro audio person, so I don't know in detail about that, but for most people would not use that pro audio output. You'd overload the input of a lot of amps actually trying to use that. Now, you also have for power input, you have a uh, power input socket, and you also have a pass-through, so the power supply that comes with this, you could also use it to daisy chain to a Pro ICANN if you wanted to use both together with just one power supply. Now I don't know how many devices you can daisy chain before it starts to run out of steam, but um, yeah, it doesn't come with a cable to do this, but you just have to have someone make up a DC to DC cable. So now back onto the outputs, well I should say the headphone outputs and the controls. On the front you have many, many, many buttons and controls which can be rather confusing. Like the Pro ICANN you have your volume on the right hand side and the input on the left. And uh, this would, and the screen indicates which uh, input you're using, and you also have a digital filter control here. And one of the big deals about this is that they have a variety of digital filters you can switch from. It has an FPGA inside, which will upsample and resample as necessary. You also have DSD upsampling, which you can activate by pressing the button, which we'll get into in a bit. 
Now, you also, on the terms of uh, output, if you've seen the ProICAN, it has uh, three gain settings, and this is inherited in the uh, Pro IDSD. You have uh, zero, which is probably suitable for IEMs. You have a gain of nine, which is most suitable for regular headphone listening, and uh, 18 if you're using something like HE6s or Susvaras. Now, you also have the, also from the Pro ICAN, you have the tube and tube plus mode. So you can have it running in solid state mode, you can have it running in tube mode, which uh, runs the uh, output through a uh, pair of tubes that are in here, and unfortunately not read readily rollable because you have to disassemble the device to actually do that, or tube plus mode, which removes some of the negative feedback so you get a slightly more euphoric sound, maybe at the expense of accuracy. Now, powering on the, the Pro IDSD has some pretty cool features. For a start, it has a little uh, status light, obviously laser drilled into the front face plate in the manner of the you know, little eyesight cameras that Apple had. And it uh, flashes you know, various colors depending on the status of the unit. Now, of course, when it's powering on, it's going to take a little while. You can see it's loading up the firmware into the FPGA there. But once it's powered on, it has a really cool feature. When you power it off, the volume control is turned down to zero. So, But when you power it back on, once this powers on, you'll see it will restore the previous volume that was set. In this case, I set it up kind of about halfway almost. And just as it's hitting now, almost there, and restoring last volume. I think that's pretty cool. Anyhow, if you don't want it to do that, obviously you turn it down to manually, uh, manually down to zero yourself before you power it off. Now once you've got that, you have a screen that shows a num the status of the unit in a number of different ways. At the moment it's showing PCM, so it's in PCM mode, and the current output frequency, which is 44 kilohertz because it's in bit perfect mode, in other words, non-oversampling mode, and you also show the input there, the uh, USB input, and it's in 44 kilohertz. Now, with the input selection, of course, you can turn this as necessary through to uh, the uh, ones desired. It also shows an optical input there. That's because in the box, it will come with an optical adapter if you want to use optical with your SPDIF. Uh, also, you have, of course, BNC input for the word clock and uh, the uh, app input, which any of the app inputs will automatically select whether it's wireless uh, of the uh, wired network or any of the uh, through the Muso app if you start playing back through the uh, micro SD card or the uh, USB drive that it's attached. So I've got USB selected here. Now also the filters you have if you use a bit bit perfect filter obviously there's no oversampling there's also the bit perfect plus mode. Now bit perfect uh, normal, normal oversampling requires very heavy roll off uh, above, say, about 10 kilohertz, because you get really severe aliasing, which is why you have digital filters in the first place, and you can see this in some of my other videos. Now, to avoid this roll-off, they have a special filter which will not uh, kind of make reduce that slight kind of uh, dullness that you get with uh, non-oversampling. I haven't listened to it extensively, but that's what they reckon it will do. It won't work in all modes. It don't, if you have uh, do your own uh, upsampling or oversampling or input DSD, obviously that won't work. It's only for use with uh, kind of low frequency, things like uh, regular CD quality or maybe not much higher uh, musical input. I think it's up to 96K. Anyway, you also have Gibbs Transient Optimized Filter, the GTO filter, which is uh, IFI's uh, special filter. It's a short uh, filter with uh, an impulse response. will have low, very short pre and post ringing. They, that's their uh, ideal filter, they reckon, for that, for the uh, four PCM1793 DACs that are inside the Pro IDSD. Uh, there's also an appetizing filter. Appetizing filters you see on uh, DACs which have uh, AKM DACs built in there. Uh, that was a kind of big deal about about 10 years ago. They reckon that uh, some people reckon that uh, having a filter where if you put an impulse response through and it had low pre ringing but a uh, long post ringing, that was uh, kind of ideal. Anyway, that's there for people who are interested in that. They also have a high, uh, a, a long filter, a high tap filter in the, in the manner of quarter, 16,000 tap filter called the transient aligned filter. And that is, if you want the most kind of accurate output, you can get that. After those filters, you can also have DSD upsampling. So if I pop this in, you can either have DSD 512 or DSD 1024 upsampling done in the DSP, uh, the uh, FPGA built into here. So you'll see that the, in the output then indicates to 45 megahertz, or if I go back to the other one, the DSD 512, it shows uh, 22 megahertz. So with the existing filter in there, and this hap the DSD processing happens after the uh, PCM filter is applied to the input music. Of course, the DSD filter, and any, actually the filters in general, will not be applied to uh, DSD input. And the other thing they won't be applied to is MQA. Now, if I start playing back MQA on here, and the display will indicate the MQA output frequency. So the MQA bypasses all the other filters entirely, 
and is only output through the inbuilt MQA filter included. If you decide to switch from, say, solid state mode to the uh, tube modes, what will happen if you watch this little status light here when I click this is that the status light will start to flash indicating that the tubes are warming up and that you need to uh, wait a little bit before they'll activate. Now I've already had the tubes warmed up here so it won't do that so I'll save you some time watching the thing flash but it will cut out the output until the tubes are sufficiently warm to uh, output you know without kind of that hum that you get when tubes are warming up. You also hear that the various outputs are delayed slightly. You'll hear the clicking in there. Slightly. So if you accidentally switch, say, for example, to a high uh, gain output mode, you can switch it back before you blow your ears out. So. so with all these features available, it became quite an interesting task to get an impression of the sound. So I decided to start off in the most kind of technically accurate setup. So I have the transient aligned filter and the solid state output mode and no DSD up sampling whatsoever. Now I use that, we are plugged in using USB 3 to my 2012 Mac Mini and that is my Rune server and plugged as a preamp into an Audio GD Master 10 which goes through to a pair of floor standing ELAC speakers. Now with that, uh, the, the easiest way to, compare, to describe the sound was to compare it to my kind of two standards, Shoot Audio's Yggdrasil and the Chord Hugo 2, the latter of which is ironically plugged into an iFi iUSB 3 most of the time and fed by a Raspberry Pi. So with that, it was a very clean and clear sound in that kind of setup. I'd probably say the edge of and that kind of setup goes to say the Chord Hugo 2 and Yggdrasil where that the both of, where the Hugo 2 especially delivers kind of a better sense of clear depth but the sound stage maybe was a kind of everything was out there so it was kind of very far away in sound and the uh, Pro IDSD maybe in comparison the word that came to mind was the sound was ever so slightly wooden compared to the kind of clean sound of the Hugo 2. So it's a very close thing, and interestingly, the other changes I made, which I'll talk about a bit later, uh, changed my impression of that. That from, from there, you can kind of sweeten the sound in various ways. And this goes back to the old classic, uh, you know, arguments between, you know, do you want the most technically accurate sound, or do you want the one that kind of gives the most feeling uh, and, and the, most, uh, the, feel, the best feeling of how the music is. To give you an, an analogy of how that works, for example, you know, if I go out and to say uh, take some photos of something in nature, say flowers or mountains or what have you, you know, I go out there and I feel, oh, this is such a wonderful place, and I, I want to capture that particular feeling. So I was out in Hawaii at one stage, and you know, the, the feeling of going and looking at the mountains there is absolutely incredible. But when you get back and look at the photos, they seem, oh, they don't give me the kind of the feeling I had when I was out there. So when I'm editing the photos, I might boost up, say, the, uh, the color, or the saturation, and the contrast a bit. And you see this often in professional photographs where they seem they're very color boosted to give you the kind of the feeling of what it was like to, to be there and take the photo, even if it's not actually a, a natural representation of what's there. As much the same way with uh, digital to analog converters is there's the choice between the most accurate and versus kind of the maybe a slightly colored, but kind of gives you the feeling, brings out the feeling of the music. And I think iFi's preferred options are for the latter in this case. In the, with the former, you know, it kind of sounds very analytical, but you would do it very enjoyable with the music. And so that was a general setup with the uh, transient align filter and solid state mode. With the tube modes, well, you know, that didn't have as much of an effect as I expected. I do know, or now we do know from the stereophile measurements, it does lower the sound by at least one decibel. And so I did feel it was very slightly quieter switching them in, so it was hard to directly compare, but maybe the sound was just a touch sweeter with you know, the tube modes engaged, not as much of a dramatic effect as one might expect. I mean, you could open up the unit and put in different tubes to see how that goes, and that would be an interesting thing as well. But you know, maybe it just, for, especially with the transient line filter, just took the edge off slightly, which was very pleasant. Now from there, there are other ways you can kind of uh, soften up the sound. Probably the obvious one is to go straight to bit perfect mode. Now, bit perfect mode goes means it's non oversampling. Now, non oversampling DACs are technically poor. I um, mean, if you see uh, the measurements of a non oversampling DAC, they compared to a, an oversampling DAC, you'll see that the uh, you know the the noise floor and the distortion increases dramatically. But actually, in practical terms, you don't notice a a huge difference, but you do notice a significant difference in the sound, although it doesn't, necess doesn't necessarily sound worse, it just send generally sounds kind of softer and, and less clear, and instead of like a wide and, and deep, it maybe sounds more closed in and narrow. Uh, depending on the, you know, the setup, it might bring out, the, it might you hear the uh, instruments slightly differently. 
And I think a lot of people prefer this, especially listening to, say, maybe classical music or jazz, or listening to instruments in general, as, you know, the instruments can sound too sharp with a, with a, with a regular, accurately tuned deck sometimes. Um, that could a lot to have a lot to do with the recording as well. And some people just like that softer, gentler sound that sounds more euphoric. And, you know, the distortion that's introduced, you know, by things like tubes or by things like non-oversampling can sound more pleasant. Where I thought it was a good match was, now if you put CD quality uh, music through it, then you're going to have uh, distortion within the audible range, albeit most of it's above 10 kilohertz, but it is there. If you have high-res classical, on the other hand, let's say you have double CD quality, so 88.2 or you know a 96, which is just over double, then you will it'll push all that distortion outside the audible range. It's the equivalent of having two times oversampling in a DAC almost, and that means that can balances things out nicely because you don't have any digital filter interfering with the actual music itself, so you don't have anything that you know. Uh, may make it sound less pleasant, but so you, you get kind of a, a, a purer sound in some respects to that and you don't have so much anywhere near as much distortion as you would just using CD quality music. You know, it's a pity nowadays, it's a pity actually in, in retrospect that CDs were never 48 kilohertz as a lot of these arguments would have been solved from the start if they'd just done that. Anyhow, with that, the other going from there in the other direction, you also have the appetizing filter which is worth a mention. It's an accurate filter. They were kind of popular about a decade ago, or a big deal a decade ago, I suppose, and, and to some degree they still live on. If you have an AKM-based DAC, or say even like a portable even, you'll uh, they will have this filter built in and, and activated. It's a no pre-ringing kind of filter, and I won't go into the details about what pre-ringing and post-ringing all mean. In kind of, actually most of it doesn't actually mean that much, although people make a big deal of it. But what it turns, what it affects is it tends to bring, when I listen with it, it tended to bring vocals out more, uh, more sharply and clearly and instruments more sharply and clearly in some respect. It felt that way. Well, although what actually is going on it requires a lot of technical understanding. And so that was a, a, a kind of like a, a even more like in like adding like sharpness to the music to, for, for my impressions compared to the transient line filter. Now, I think we're, you have this, uh, again, you have this issue of accuracy versus, you know, kind of euphoric sound. And I think we're in this particular DAC, because maybe because it uses the Burr Brown DACs as such, that uh, IFI's own uh, Gibbs Transient Optimized Filter was the best balance between them. Now, it's an interesting one. It gives a sweetness to the sound, but it also brings, like, instead of having that just the music is out there and it goes, there's a depth there, which you have with, the, say, the Transient Align Filter, it kind of brings everything out more into the room uh, in, in effect, like whether it's headphones I was using or speakers, it seemed to bring everything out, but it kept that sweetness. So it had the best of maybe what I felt the appetizing filter has and the best of what I had the best bit perfect filter has and combines that all together. It's not the most accurate filter, obviously. It's a short filter. It has few taps. Um, I think it probably just by a hair loses a little bit of detail compared to the transient line filter, but I thought it was the most listenable setup with or without the tubes on, tube mode in, engaged, and it was the best and most enjoyable setup to listen with the uh, Pro IDSD. Then on the other hand, you have a DSD upsampling, and so that kind of adds another vector to it because then you can add that engages post filter. So you kind of, it, sometimes DSD upsampling to me made it kind of, so DSD in general China ha, tends to have slightly softer transients, it some, sometimes can sound a little bit more spacious and sometimes does not. So it's kind of that thing, it worked with some music and not with others, and I'd have to go through a lot of stuff to kind of nail down where I felt I liked it best. But, you know, it was something to engage and sometimes could make the music sound really nice depending on, you know, you could one of those things to add to fiddle around with and one that I couldn't quite nail down how I felt about it. But it's there. One of the things about the Pro IDSD is it has its own headphone amp. Now they're working, I believe, on a 4.4 millimeter output, but if you want the full balanced output, you only have a, this kind of strange choice of a 2.5 millimeter output. Now, for, for various reasons, the Moon Audio cable that Moon Audio supplied has a 2.5 millimeter connector, and it turned out to be a good thing in this case, as I could use it with a Pro IDSD. Now, you'd think, well, you know, why wouldn't you use the Pro ICANN? And actually, I liked the Pro IDSD with the Susvaras. So, with them, you know, they require a lot of power and, you know, a lot of drive and are best, according to many people, uh, you know, out of speaker amps and that kind of thing. While the Pro ICANN gave them more punch, 
I really like them out of, directly out of the Pro IDSD. Now, it, it has enough uh, power for them easily to drive them in balanced mode. And, you know, they sound very pleasant. Not as punchy as they can, again, on more powerful amps. But I like the combination of detail and drive directly into these. And as I the setup I just mentioned, the Gibbs Transient Optimized Filter Engage, I actually have the uh, Hugo 2 uh, powering a prototype amp from, which I'll talk about when, it, when it's released. And that kind of came very clean and clear. You know, I was giving feedback about how well it, how it drove these. And it's kind of very clean and clear. But you know, sometimes, you know, I like the slightly nicer musicality of the Pro I can for choice with the Susvaras. And I used it with other headphones as well. The only problem I had was with IEMs, and it was a problem I had with the uh, wireless, where the um, the wireless circuitry can't be shut off, and with the aerial on there, and sometimes with even with the aerial off, uh, very, very sensitive IEMs such as the Campfire Audio Solaris, you could very hear some noise going on in the background from the electronics. So that was the only kind of negative about that. Also, using it as a preamp, it worked very, very well. I used it directly, as I said, to the Master 10, to the speakers, and I, that was an easy setup to use because I could switch stuff here, and now I've got a long set of cables that go down to the amp, and that worked perfectly. And again, the only problem I had with that is I used it as a DAC to another headphone amp, actually the SoundAware P1, and when I tried to plug in IEMs to the SoundAware, well, it picked up a whole lot of noise from the Pro IDSD. So that's really the only disappointing thing is that the amount of noise generated by the inbuilt circuitry sometimes interferes if you have very sensitive you know, headphones or IEMs, that noise can come through to other components or through to the output. It would have been good if they had some means of actually shutting that off so that uh, the uh, at least the noise could be reduced when people want, you know, don't need the uh, networking components. So this leads on to other digital inputs. Now, the Pro IDSD, as we've already seen, has a, you know, not only just USB, but the optical, SPDIF, and uh, the network inputs. So I thought something I'd try, I always tried to see how the USB input compares to using a, a you know a SPDF converter of my choice. So in that case, I have a Singer F1 in this case, which I plugged very directly into the uh, back of the Pro IDSD, and not hanging off. If you're wondering, you've got big feet on here to uh, you know to get supported on the desk, and in in that using actually IFI's only own iUSB 3, you know, wasn't expecting, you know, kind of any indifference in the sound because they reckon their own uh, USB implementation has got everything necessary. But I still found that the sound with this instead was slightly sweeter and slightly nicer than the direct USB input from my Mac Mini. So the other thing was to compare the US, the uh, network inputs. And likewise, uh, you know, there have been other people with other DACs who have said, you know, the network inputs or network streaming has sounded better. And it was the same case with the Pro IDSD. Using the network input, I had the choice of, you know, streaming from, say, Audivana Plus, as it's, recognized, it's a uh, universal plug and play device, and that could stream directly. And I felt that the sound was nicer with that. Now, there's also the Muso app, which can control, you know, a micro SD card inside this thing. The only problem with that is that there's no. I have 878 songs on a micro SD card in there. There are the 878 songs, and there's a no option in the app to do anything other than list them song by song. No genre, artist, uh, album, anything like that. That was kind of a problem, and it really put me off, you know, wanting to use that. So it's one of those features that I thought, mm, why did they do that if it, they couldn't have, you know, a full set of options? But the nice thing about it is I could go across, and it's got a title option in here, and... I can jump into my own title albums here. Now, of course, there's only title, is you know, another, no other features such as Cobars or anything like that. And but you know, I generally tended to use it with Rune, and Rune, there's no Rune support for Universal Plug and Play. So if I wanted Rune support, I had to use another device. So sitting behind me here, I have the SoundAware D300 reference, which is coming for review. That is a successor to a, a previous device I reviewed, or the not on video, and it has been set up with Rune support. And I used that using the AES input to the Pro IDSD. And again, you know, I was comparing that, you know, the uh, the different inputs. You know, can it, I wanted to see if the D300 reference could beat my uh, Singer F1 setup, and it did. And it provided the nicest sound overall into the, the Pro IDSD. Now it also has word clock output. This has word clock input, and I tried that briefly. I'm not sure, that the, I'll go into the details about my experiences with that in the, in the, in the, the review for the D300 reference, but Suffice to say, it definitely worked out that a good transport improved the sound quality of this, especially with something like the transient line filter setup. And as I said, that the appetizing filter can sound, you know, maybe just a touch wooden compared to things like, say, Chords Hugo 2 and maybe some other DACs. 
But you know, when you have the improvement of a really good transport, that can uh, just you know, we instead of take, taking the edge off the the, the sound using, using the you know, different filters or the uh, tube modes, you can actually improve the sound to to remove any kind of uh, a sense of unpleasantness by using a better transport. And that was to me with the transient aligned filter or the appetizing filter really nice to listen with too. So the only thing that leaves is good old MQA. Now I'm not a big fan of MQA, it has a lot of technical issues about it and they've kind of not been entirely truthful about what MQA really is. There's been a bit, bit of uh, shady stuff going on there. But all the same, you know, I understand why some people appreciate MQA. The, new, the mastering they've done on some of the tracks does make it seem more clear, even if it is to me, it sounds like they run it through a DSP to, to kind of enhance, you know, certain sounds, like you get some sound enhancement plugins for uh, computers. But also, if you do like MQA, that did work very well. I did interestingly compare, you know, the sound using not uh, bypassing the MQA filters and just using the MQA filter. And the MQA filter for MQA did sound a little bit better for whatever reason. So the only thing is that the current firmware is in, in beta and the MQA firmware tends to be a little bit flaky and I've had the odd shutdown and, and what have you. And the MQA, they released the uh, Pro IDSD long before they uh, actually had MQA working, even though it said they would have MQA in the instruction manual. So it's been kind of a, a tough run for them. And it's one of those things that'll iron itself out in the end. And it's probably not so critical because the firmware will eventually become good and they've done a huge amount of work to get it going as it has. But if you, for people who like MQA, I've just got it streaming now, MQA over Universal Plug and Play from Adivana Plus and it works fine in that way. So ultimately, IFI have done really, really well in trying to cram so much stuff into this little unit. I've never seen anything with so many features and so many options in such a small package. For that for better or for worse, for the better, the sound is really up there with the $2,500 DACs and DAC amps, things like Hugo 2, Shit Audio Yggdrasil, you know, Audio GD R2R7. It's very worthy entry into that level. The negatives are you can't shut off the wireless and for me it was injecting sound into the system and it's a small box, an external power supply. And at least for its credit, you know, if the power supply dies or something like that, you can replace it. And but if you do have a good transport especially, or even if you don't, it will still give you an excellent listen and it works really, really with, well with headphones on its own. Again, not as powerfully as some large amps do. But you know, as I said, even with the really power hungry Susvaras, I really like the Pro IDSD just on its own. Unlike other DACs, you, it gives you a lot of variety of how you how you listen. You can listen to the most accurate sound on the one hand, or you can listen to a more euphoric kind of sound. And I really like the kind of euphoric presentation of the setup with the Gibbs Transient Optimized Filter and the tube modes. And it added just, you know, just hit the spot between accuracy and kind of euphoric sound for me. And so in that way, I really, really enjoyed it when it goes. And in some respects, I'm gonna really miss it. So I hope you found that review useful. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up and also become a subscriber if you'd like to see more. And also I'd like to thank the people you see online. Those people for extending me you know, a couple of bucks a month or more have helped support make these videos. And if you'd like to become a supporter, check out the links on the screen or in the description. And those people get to see these takes and reviews in advance without ads. And they also go in the draw to win stuff that had been sitting around in my cupboard for a while, you know, audio gear that manufacturers have sent me I don't need anymore. So if you'd like to join our little community of supporters, please do consider signing up below. Again, thanks very much. And if you have any questions, comments, or including constructive criticism, please do post them in the, in the uh, comments below. If you do buy or own a Pro IDSD, Tell me, tell me what you think of it. Did my, was my video accurate? Let me know and post in the comments below. And otherwise, I'll see you online.